Today's lesson is going to be on double displacement reactions. So far, if you're watching the videos in order, we have looked at synthesis, decomposition, you know they're kind of the opposite of each other. We looked at single replacement, and today we're looking at double displacement. And um, probably the easiest way to describe a double displacement reaction is I want you to think about it as the double date. So I've got a little story for you here. Um, you can see that we've got a couple going out on a date with another couple. At some point in the date, they decide that they're going to switch dates. And um, a quick and easy way to teach this to students is when you're looking at the ionic compound and the ionic compound, I want you to think positive, negative, positive, negative. You just say Audi, Audi. You put the two outer ones together and then any, any. So it's Audi, Audi, any, any. And if you put them together in that order, you will always pair up the correct ions to make the new compounds. So here's another way to look at it. It's always positive, negative, plus a positive, negative, and that's going to give you two new pairs, which are also positive, negative, positive, negative. Noticing just like when we write ionic compounds, you always write the positive ion first and the negative ion second. And if you can crisscross and you can write ionic compounds, these are literally a piece of cake, not a problem at all. So it is very helpful if you have a good handle on writing ionic compounds today. It is also helpful if you, um, if you know your polyatomic ions. So I'm gonna put them right here because in ionic compounds, sometimes we see polyatomic ions and they will show up in double displacement reactions as well. So if you don't know these, make sure you've got them in front of you. Um, I did want to point out that on single replacement, we use the activity series because we had to see if the single element could kick out an element in a compound. We don't need that today. The cool thing about today's reactions is it's going to happen. They are automatically going, going to switch places and we don't have to worry about one element being stronger than another to make that happen. They will always switch. So that makes um, double displacement reactions really easy to work with. These are a lot of fun. I think I said it last time. These might be my favorites. I love these. And it's really neat for beginning chemistry students because they look really like just nasty and they're long and there's all this stuff in it. But if you know a few simple tricks, these are really, really easy. And a lot of my students typically think these are the easiest ones to do. It is also helpful if you have your reference table packet in front of you so that you can see your different types of reactions. You know, this is the ultimate guide to writing chemical reactions. And here are your double displacements. We're going to look at both of these types today. We're going to look at just your, what I would call, general double displacement reaction, and then we're going to look at a special type called acid-base neutralization reactions, and we're just going to get a little taste of those today. We'll learn more about those when we do our unit on acids and bases. So that said, let's start our notes on double displacement reactions, and you can see I have the general reaction written here, and like I said earlier, you have two ionic compounds. They are literally going to switch ions. You'll put the two outers together. That's where you got A and D. And then you'll put the two inner ones together. And if you go in this pattern, left to right, and then on the inside, right to left, you'll always have them written correctly. You'll have the cation written first and the anion written second. Now, honestly, it doesn't matter. Like, if these two were switched, that's okay, but I'm just a creature of habit, and that's how mine always work out. So, some general information about double displacement reactions. You have two reactants. They are ionic compounds. They will exchange ions and form new compounds. Also, we often will see the formation of a precipitate when we have a double displacement reaction, and if you'll remember, a precipitate is an indication of a chemical change. And it is basically a solid that forms when you mix two aqueous 
solutions of ionic compounds. And I don't um, have the AQs right here, but these are dissolved in water. That's what allows the new ions to meet up. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. I was just keeping everything real simple for you for today. So as long as you can understand just that top little portion I gave you and you can write ionic compounds, like I said earlier, these are a breeze. You'll feel so good when you learn how to do them and you'll see they're really very easy. So, before we actually get into writing the formulas, I want to show you if you had molecule eyes and you could actually see molecules and what was going on in a beaker, I want you to see what this would look like. And this is, it, you know, it's hard in chemistry sometimes to wrap your mind around things because you can't see them. So that's where drawing pictures uh, comes in very handy. So I want you to imagine that we have two beakers. And we're going to fill them with water. You see those little AQs? That stands for aqueous. And that means this is actually sodium chloride dissolved in water. This is actually silver nitrate dissolved in water. And we haven't gotten into our lesson on talking about ionization and dissociation. But I'm going to go ahead and edge into it a little bit here. When we put sodium chloride in water, it is soluble. And what that means is it's going to dissociate into the two parts that made it up. And by two parts, I mean sodium chloride is a ratio of one sodium to one chlorine atom, one sodium to one chloride. So if you could see these in water, for every one sodium ion, you would see one chloride ion. Now, you know there are bazillions of these. I'm just going to draw one to keep it simple, and I'm just going to throw a few water molecules in there because the AQ tells us they're actually dissolved in water. So if you could just imagine this millions upon millions upon bazillions of times, that's what's going on in this beaker. When you see AgNO3 aqueous, that tells you that the silver nitrate is also dissolved in water. So there's one silver to every one nitrate ion, and I know that because this is a one-to-one -one ratio. We're going to go ahead and throw some waters in here as well. So they're just kind of floating around in these little water molecules. We're not worried about concentration right now, like how much water is there compared to how much um, solute. We're just looking at what's happening in those beakers. Now, these guys right here have never met these guys. So these two beakers have never met. So what we're going to do is we're going to pour them together into one big beaker. So we'll just draw a big beaker here. Now, what's going to happen when you pour these together, all of a sudden these sodiums, chlorines, silvers, and nitrates are all going to meet for the first time. Now, um, the sodiums and nitrates are like, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you. But they're still just kind of floating around in the waters. So we have one sodium to one nitrate. And again, I'm just going to draw one representation of that. So these guys are just, you know, hanging out, floating in the waters. But when this silver and this chlorine met, they were like, oh, my gosh, like, I really like you. You know, silver's like, hey, chloride, I like you. And chloride's like, wow, I like you, too. And so they say, you know, maybe we should get married. So they bond very tightly. When they meet, a, meet up, they love each other. They form what we call a precipitate. They form a solid that water can't even pull apart. And so eventually, these end up going to the bottom of the beaker. That's our precipitate. It, um, when you have a precipitate, you know, initially when you mix these, your solution might look cloudy. Um, but if you leave them alone and just let it set, over time, they're going to settle out to the bottom. So we're just going to put the little silver chlorides down here kind of in a chunk. And they're probably just settled out in the bottom as a powder. And those are actually little crystals. So those are called our precipitate, and then you know you've got your water going on. Now, I don't expect you um, today to know that that's going to be a solid and that's going to be aqueous. That's going to come in our solubility lesson. But I just wanted you to see what's happening and why double displacement reactions often give us precipitates. Um, I'll teach you this on solubility rules, and it's really cool. So that'll just be taking this one step further. But the important thing you see here is... The sodiums and the nitrates met up, the silvers 
and the chlorides met up, and you can see those two products right here. We're not going to get too wrapped up in today into putting aqueous and solid and all that stuff. Today, I just want you to know these meet up and these meet up, and what do you get? So that's what we're going to practice now. So let's just take off and do some double displacement reactions. Now, I think it's easiest for beginning students to write your ions out. So, like, you know that that came, potassium's a plus one, bromide's a minus one. That's where that came from. You know silver's a plus one, chloride's a minus one. That where that, that's where that came from. Now, if the two outer ones meet, that's going to be the K with a plus one and a Cl with the minus one. We know the ones cancel, so that's going to be KCl. Then we're going to put together silver and bromide. Notice I say silver first because we want to write the positive one first. Silver's a plus one, bromide's a minus one. Again, they cancel, so AgBr, and you are done. So put the outer two together, go here, and then go here. And you get potassium chloride and silver bromide. Remember, this came from potassium with a plus one and chloride with a minus one, silver with a plus one, and bromide with a minus one. You don't have to write all these little ions down, but again, for beginning chemistry students, I think it's super helpful. All right, let's look at number two. We've got so, um, sodium hydroxide with calcium bromide. So we're going to put sodium and bromide together. Sodium is Na plus one, bromide is Br minus one. Remember, go back to the original ions. You don't put that two up here. This two is here because of this relationship, the way these two were crisscrossed. You always go back to the original ions. So that's going to be NaBr because the ones cancel. And again, we're just crisscrossing like crazy, right in ionic compounds. Then we're going to put calcium with hydroxide. Calcium is Ca plus two. Hydroxide is OH minus one. When they crisscross, you're going to get CaOH2, and those are your new products. Let's do number three. Got to be careful here because iron is a transition metal. So I've got to ask myself real quick, what iron was that? Well, this two probably came from up here, and that makes sense because this would have been a negative one, which would have come down here. So I'm going to make myself a little note. This is iron with a plus two charge. I need to know that because when I crisscross it with its new partner, I've got to know the correct charge. So we're going to put iron with a plus two with chloride with a minus one. That's going to be FeCl2 plus, now we're going to put calcium with nitrate. Again, notice I always write the positive one first. Calcium is a plus two. Nitrate is NO3 minus one. And when you crisscross, you will get CaNO3-2. Let's take a look at number four. We are putting potassium nitrate with aluminum chloride. We're going to put potassium with chloride. You know potassium is a plus one, chloride is a minus one. So that is KCl plus aluminum with nitrate, aluminum is Al plus 3, nitrate is NO3 minus 1, so you've got AlNO3, 3. And the last one, zinc bromide plus potassium phosphate. We're going to hook zinc and phosphate up first. We know that zinc is a plus two. That's one of the exceptions that we have memorized. We know that phosphate is PO4 minus three, so that will be ZN3, PO4, two. Plus potassium with bromide. Potassium is a plus one. Bromide is a minus one KBr. So you can see these are really simple. Just think... Put the outer two together, then put the inner two together. Hop left to right on the inside, right to left, and you'll always have everything in the correct order. And by correct order, I mean you'll have your cation, anion, cation, anion. 
Again, it doesn't matter if you switch the order of these. That's not going to make a difference. They're both products. Um, and you can see this would be look really complicated to somebody who didn't know, one, they're polyatomic ions, or two, how to crisscross. But if you know those two things and just how to handle a double displacement reaction, piece of cake. Now, there's one more type of double displacement reaction that I want to talk to you about. And that is an acid-base neutralization reaction. Also, also a type of double displacement, but in this case, you don't get a precipitate. You get something kind of special here. So um, let's look at the first one. I have a base, and I know this is a base because it is a metal with hydroxide. That's how you know you've got a base. And I've got an acid. I know that's an acid because it's got an H in the front. And generally, that's how we recognize an acid. Now, we're going to handle these the same way. We're going to put the outer two together, and we're going to put the inner two together. So we already know the process. When I put calcium with phosphate, calcium's a plus two, phosphate is PO4 minus three, I'm going to get CA3PO42. Nothing new there. That's just like we did on the previous examples. Plus, now I'm putting H with OH. And all you need to know is anytime you are crisscrossing hydronium and hydroxide, you get water. So instead of getting a solid precipitate on an acid-base neutralization reaction, you will always get a salt, that is any ionic compound, and water. So we're going to make a note of that. Acid plus base or base plus acid, you know, it doesn't matter. And this is a strong acid, strong base reaction. Yields a salt, which is just an ionic compound, and water. So if anyone ever asks you, what are the two products of a strong acid, strong base reaction? You will say salt and water knowing the ionic compound you get is the salt, and knowing that crisscrossing hydronium and hydroxide gives you water. You also may see um, water written like that. That is the same thing. So these are the same. A lot of times when we're doing acid-base chemistry, we'll actually write water HOH and just know that's just water. All right, let's look at number two. I've got um, sodium hydroxide, which I know is a base because it's a metal with hydroxide, and I've got sulfuric acid. So we're going to put the outer two together. Sodium is a plus one. Sulfate is SO4 minus two. That's going to be Na2SO4. There's my salt. Plus, I'm going to put hydronium with hydroxide. Hydronium's a plus one, hydroxide's a minus one, that is H2O. So again, my acid-base reaction gave me a salt and gave me water. One more, and you'll have this, this is so easy. Hydronium and hydroxide, we already know that gives me water, so I'm going to write that down again. The order of your products doesn't matter. Potassium and chlorine. Potassium's a plus one, chloride's a minus one, KCl. So just remember, you have two basic types of double displacement reactions. You have the first type that we saw, which are just two ionic compounds, aqueous solutions of two ionic compounds. And I will say this, while um, double displacement reactions are notorious for forming precipitates, there might be some instances where you actually don't get one, and that's okay. But usually, you're going to see a precipitate. And just remember, with the acid-base neutralization reactions, you're not going to get a solid precipitate, but you are going to get water as one of your products. So that sums up double displacement reactions. Um, super simple. I think you could probably do these with no problem now. So if you have any trouble on these, just make sure you review your polyatomic ions and you also maybe take another look at writing ionic compounds.